Um, Mr. Speaker, we believe in the status quo. A lot of people who do not deserve to be at the top decide what, how the vast majority of people would live. And we believe this is unjust and that the opening government we're going to uh, fix that. Two things would be from opening government. First, we will show you that the acquisition process of wealth was unjust. And secondly, uh, how this would solve the utilitarian problems that we have in the status quo. Uh, but before that, just to clarify, what policy do we support on our side of the house? So by radical redistribution of wealth, we mean like things like inheritance tax when we take away the, uh, uh, for example, 70% of the stuff that, uh, uh, that people might have inherited and that this does not necessarily mean nationalization but we give uh, uh, nationalization of certain industries but we give that uh, a, a way to, to to the people through welfare programs tax reliefs business opportunities like subsidies so it does not necessarily mean state control but just rather just taking the uh, wells that exist and giving it to the other people so alternative for their side of the house is just to defend uh, the system as it exists now uh, so the first point, why acquisition process was unjust? We believe even if the, both uh, opposition sides would claim to you that certain people have worked for that and that they deserve that, we have two responses to that. Firstly, in most, in vast majority of instances, the, the wealthy people just have inherited that. They haven't worked, they just get the dividends for, for being born in a certain family uh, for their name, which they do not deserve, which is a absolutely arbitrary factor. So they actually do not work, they just get money That's for good. being and existing. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, are we talking about a global redistribution or, or a redistribution only on a state level? Uh, I guess like all the state around the world would be uh, would redistribute uh, that wealth uh, in the way that they want. But we believe the vast majority of the countries would follow our model. So uh, second response, even if, uh, uh, even if certain people uh, have worked for that, we say that the process that they have gained that wealth was also based on the arbitrary factors like talents and intellectual abilities or even pure luck that the, you also do not deserve and this is something that is completely arbitrary. So as a consequence of that, some people remain at the top and the vast majority suffer. So why does this, the, the fact that it was unjustly acquired means that we, ha we can redistribute that? We believe in the status quo citizens pay uh, uh, and pay taxes to the uh, state and the, for the reason, things like security and equal treatment for that, uh, from that state. But as it stands now, this equal treatment is not provided to the 99% of the population. And we say state has an obligation to, uh, uh, to redistribute that wealth as a, uh, as a precondition of the equality that state should grant to all citizens. So this is the principal argument that we believe uh, would stand regardless of any consequences. But how does it solve uh, uh, the problems that we have in the status quo? Uh, we believe, uh, secondly, so uh, it solves problems like so, uh, uh, poverty because just uh, people have far more opportunities they, that they do have now. That's to say, uh, like things like health care, they can get sick leave, uh, 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 they can afford to do so, and uh, uh, some people can get subsidies and uh, start their own businesses and uh, get wealthier as well and improve their lives, which they do not have access in the status quo because it is it's a lot of uh, uh, well the people lobby against that because it is kind of uh, perceived as un, uh, unfair competition also a lot of people get education they can enrich themselves and uh, uh, study and uh, get uh, education uh, pay for their colleges and uh, improve their life so all of this stuff related with public goods also gets better like roads infrastructure housing this is the things that grant people as uh, problems and this is the things that people compete for in the status quo. So even if uh, certain people would still fail and this would still become poor, they would have more, uh, uh, more social ladders for the individuals and they have resources uh, and that they can afford uh, uh, and they have far more opportunities on our side of the house. And this is more resources on our side of the house. That's to say they can vote, they, uh, they, can, they can afford to protest or to strike without the fear of being uh, uh, 
uh, fire from their job. So all of impact, all of that impacts. Uh, uh, so what are the impacts of that? We say, firstly, this is the like food on the table for the millions of people who do not have that in the status quo. Secondly, we say this is the less crime and violence because the vast majority of crimes that, that, are, ha that are happening in the status quo happen because people need resources because the state doesn't provide them and that the, they just try, try to feed themselves. That's why we have a lot of crime. Like this is the reason why people join gangs in, in the uh, Latin American countries and the narco cartels so we think this is solved on our side of the house as well so that 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 also means the third impact that the far more people have self-esteem and they feel empowered because they do not uh, uh, feel uh, uh, they do not feel ashamed of their uh, social economic status and this is get this is getting better on our side of the house before i'll talk about the alternative i, I want to take a PO and ask you why any Okay, fine. So what's the al uh, alternative for their side of the house? We believe on the alternative, you have to wait all the people to give up their privileges, which they very unlikely to do given the amount of uh, 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 utility that they enjoy in the status quo. And the, we, we say this is bad because they control the, the states, they lobby uh, uh, for their politicians, they lobby, lobby certain policies. Yeah. As, uh, yeah, okay. Yes, but what do you mean by radical? You do understand that it doesn't only mean taking from the one percent; it's taking from almost everyone. Uh yes, but we believe that you would mostly take from the wealthy people because that they are the one who uh, who are controlling the vast majority wealth in the status quo. So uh, it, it might mean for middle class higher taxation, but they would we, we think this is okay. Like people in Denmark enjoy a lot of public goods without even uh, uh, feeling that taxation. Uh, so we don't think that's crucial. So uh, that, uh, continuing my point, we believe that, so you cannot uh, wait for the state uh, to do so because the uh, wealthy uh, affect that state to a great extent. The campaign fund, uh, they provide campaign fundings and the their interests are always considered. They also control media and the narratives about how uh, ordinary people perceive what, what how uh, a good policy looks like, what, uh, what, who is the good politician and whom should we vote for. All of that means in the status quo, you cannot achieve. And even if you achieve, achieve this, is the, this is going to be very slow. And this would come at the expense of the middle class who have to wait for the, uh, who do not have the food and clothes in the status quo and the waiting for them is not an option. Very proud to propose, thank you. I thank the Prime Minister for that speech. I would now like to invite the Leader of the Opposition to continue this debate. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so today in my speech I'm going to address two points. I'm going to speak to you first of all about the right of property, second of all about market incentives and why we believe in the uh, world uh, tomorrow the market incentives will uh, be lower, but before that a few points of uh, rebuttal. So first point of rebuttal. Note that the, not, please note that the government is mostly, uh, mostly legitimizes the, their case when they're saying that inheritance is, is something that is bad. Inheritance laws are something that are only preserving the, uh, the riches of the world. But what, what we want to say to that is, first of all, it's not entirely true. I mean, you can see that even in, uh, you can see that in countries that, uh, like US, uh, more, more than 60 or 70 percent of the, of the uh, CEOs and millionaires today are not born uh, rich. They're, there are things like hard work. There are things like social mobility. Social mobility today. So that's not that's not entirely true. The, how how a government pictures the world. But moreover, we believe that, we believe that inheritance has. So, has uh, has good things about it because inheritance is also a, a large incentive for people to actually do work harder for people for people to spend money because uh, I'm not I'm not just collecting the money I'm not just collecting money I'm actually spending it I'm actually investing it in uh, so, in social stuff to make the world better for my children this is a lot of time the re a reason for people like Bill Gates and huge CEOs to still go to work because they want to collect more money for the 
their children to inherit later works. But, uh, but more on that later. Uh, second point of rebuttal, please know that we are not arguing with the, uh, with the government point about money giving more opportunities, money, uh, all, if all the people will be rich, there will be less crime and stuff like that. Yes, you're entirely correct. The question is, the question is, is whatever it is legitimate to actually take the money from the rich people and from the medium class people and redistribute it. And now, please note, uh, and third point of rebuttal, please note that in the world tomorrow, there will still be rich people. There will still be people with great influence, with great uh, reputation, the people that are controlling the media and et cetera. And it means that, uh, means that we're not changing this, this sort of world. We're just moving, we're, we're, just, uh, we're just creating new people with, the, with these sorts of influence and we don't see any change. And fourth and last, please note that when we're speaking about radical redistribution, we're not talking only about taking from the 1% of the riches. We are talking about also the middle class. We are talking about also people who are who are not that much in power like the first government want us to believe. If we're looking, if we were looking at the Scandinavian model, we see that even the poorest people are still paying a lot of taxes, and we think this is something that can that harms the entire population and not only the one percent of the richest. And now let's go directly to my case. So. Let's start with the first point of, of, I will explain to you why we think the, uh, the right for property is a, is a legitimate right, why we believe that you can't infringe on it only to make, or, uh, you can't infringe on it. So first we believe that there is this thing uh, of like the theory, the theory of working. It means that, that you, you did invest time you did you did invest resources you did you did invest your own uh, your own capabilities into creating something it means that it means that a lot of and a lot of time you see this later later on as uh, as the benefits of your work and, and it means it's not legitimate to take your to take your profits because you are actually spend a lot of yourself of like uh, your time is the alternative costs of you going to work and stuff like that for 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 your property second of all we believe your property is a large part Part of your identity is how you define yourself. It's what it what a lot of times give you the sense of security to be your own. It means that yes, we live in a capitalistic world. A lot of time I am defined by but I am defined by this the sort of product the products that I'm using, by the sort of font that I'm using, by the clothes that I am wearing, etc. Not now, thank you. And it means that, and it means that, and it means that taking stuff from me that I worked for, that are a huge part of my identity, will actually infringe on 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 who I am. Furthermore, we believe that your property is a huge part of your autonomy. It means that it means that you have the money to be in control. You have the money to affect your 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 closest environment, your family, your house, the way you live. It means that it gives you a sense of security to uh, uh, to to live prosper and stuff like that. And it means that. Taking away your property is also an infringement on your autonomy. Now, please know that we didn't hear any sort of of uh, of. Uh, of a, of a legitimate cause, uh, cause from government side to infringe on this right, uh, right of, of the people. And we believe that this is simply wrong for the three reasons that I gave you. Now, let's move to the second, to the second point about how the market will look like and why we believe that it will, be, it will harm the market and harm uh, most of the people. So first of all, we believe that like the most basic idea that you need incentives to invest invest in the future. Why? So first of all, you are you have less incentives to invest to build your own company and stuff like this when you know that things will be taken for you. But moreover, you even have less incentive to. Uh, uh, you, you have less incentive because your savings are being taken from you. you like the, the amount of money that even if you were not using it, it what gave you this, it, this amount that was sitting on your bank, bank account is what what gave you the security to actually invest, to actually uh, to actually build new business, to take risks? Those are the stuff that we will see less tomorrow. People inventing in stuff in in uh, in in, uh, in, uh, in risky in more risky projects. Uh, before uh, I continue, your eyes, last chance. Yeah. Uh, autonomy that is acquired at the cost of the others does not matter because it harms the other people. The similarly, for example, the slave owners had uh, had the autonomy at the cost of the slaves, so we don't think that this actually uh, justifies the autonomy. 
Well, yeah, of course, and we're not pro slavery, but the analogy is not the same at all. You worked, you, you, you worked fairly, you didn't abuse any people, you work with, uh, within the regulations of the state to, ac to accumulate this money. The fact, the, fact that, the fact that on the like maybe third or fourth or fifth level, somebody, somebody got hurt, it's not something that we as people can anticipate. I am, harm I am harming some kid in China when I'm using my iPhone, but it's not like you will block, uh, you will uh, uh, make iPhones outload because some people in Africa are being harmed. This is not how we work today. Now, let's get into more into market incentives. So basically we are saying that you will take, take less risks tomorrow. Why it's crucial? Because a lot of times we see that people, that people who are taking risk, risk, risk are actually inventing in, in uh, new companies, companies that are beneficial for more, more of us. I'm out of time, so Murad will continue more on the uh, economic point about the market, but we're really proud to oppose. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for that speech. I would like to invite the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the debate for government side. One second, please. So, okay, <clears throat> I'll talk about two things. First, about legitimacy and the private property. And second, about motivation and all the investments. So first about private property. I think what opening opposition misses is all the uh, explanation that given by the prime minister, how all the poor population are victimized, how all of them, uh, all of them uh, uh, live in those hot conditions. And it's also unjust. That's why the question isn't whether like, uh, whether there are some people that acquired private property by themselves, but the question is do we have a right as a society to put all of those people to the same race? That's to, do we have a right to put a person who was born without talent, who was born in poor family into the same race of uh, getting more and more, uh, more and more property with the person who was, born, who was born in a rich family and can make all of those things? I think initially rights of the people are already discriminated. That's say yes. We believe maybe when we support this um, distribu uh, distribution, maybe to some extent, in some instances, we actually uh, we, we, we actually discriminate some pe some some people. But on our side of the house, there are tons of people that are already dis discriminated, and therefore we, we believe we believe that that we actually def defend themselves. So the question is actual comparison. Who should we prioritize? Should we prioritize those poor people or those people who acquired their private, 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 private properties by themselves? We believe that on our side of the house, it's much more important because we have much more people on our side of the house. And so we have millions of people that don't have a water supply, millions, million, mil, millions of people that, that have to put their uh, or life to the risk every day. But secondly though, extent of the suffering on, on our side of the house is much more like harder. That, that's to say, on our side of the house, people are risking their lives. However, on side of the opposition, you just like, probably we will take away your some property, but you'll still have basic, basic needs. You still have your, your life. You still have some, some other happiness. However, on our side of the house, pe people don't really have basic, basic, basic needs. They, uh, they don't have anything. That's to say, on our side of the house, the group that we're talking about is already much, much more important on our side of the house. So the second part of my speech, I want to talk about innovations. I want to talk about all of those investments, et cetera, et, et, et cetera. But before that, just like note, we believe, yes, maybe in the status quo, there is some social mobility that exists. Maybe there is some philanthropy and help to the poor people that exist. However, know that it's uh, in the status quo, it's very limited. Let's say, yes, there is Bill Gates who invests and helps poor people, but there is only Bill Gates and like a uh, very limited amount of population. So on our side of the house, we have much more uh, massive help to the, to, the pop, to the population, like millions of people still sent on our side of the house. So let's talk about innovations. Let's talk about working and uh, m motivation of the people to work. I think, firstly, what's opening opposition misses in this debate is like is 
financial incentive is the only motivator to work hard to contribute to this to the to the society we live a people always adjust to the changes let's say it's not only financial incentive that motivates you to, to do some work but also other stuff let's say respect of the communi commu community respect of other people or the, f the fact that you uh, uh, you, you you have co contributed something uh, or, or many others many other stuff besides all those like fi fin financial incentives. That's say in this case all the people will actually adjust to the changes. Like that's say maybe states will incentivize incentivize people. Maybe to some extent will uh, will make some uh, pro pro uh, programs like that will incentivize people to change their criteria of happiness from the money because like probably. If financial incentives do not exist here, people have to have to adjust and have to find happiness in in, in, in other, other things. But second, 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 uh, though, though, I think maybe we actually delete a uh, vast majority of financial incentives, but there are still some financial incentives exist. Let's say we don't take away all your private property, but you still have some some property. You still have basic needs. You still have your work. You still have your fam family, and you still have an incentive to keep your work. Let's say a world is a competition. Let's say you have to uh, you you, uh, you have to defend your workplace. You have to work harder, harder and harder and harder, and you have to save all all this money. You have to feed your family, and you still have a motivation motivation to work to work and contribute to the, to the, uh, to the society to the society. We believe. Opening opposition talks about all of those investments, all of those developments, etc. Et yes, maybe people do not invest on their side of the house, but on our side of the house, we still have government which will create those businesses, which will give workplaces to people, because governments earn a lot of money in in uh, in our world, and therefore we still have businesses and development on our on our on our side of the, side of the house. But even if you don't really believe to that, like lastly. We believe, yes, maybe uh, people uh, do not have such strong incentives on our, on, on our side of the house, but still we have a strong compensation. That's to say, there are many, many children probably in Africa or in other countries that have large talents, talents to, to, to make some uh, scientific researches, talents to make some drugs, talents to create, to, to create all those huge businesses. However, in the status quo, all of those people, all of those children are neglected because they don't have an opportunity to study, they don't have an opportunity to develop, they don't have an opportunity to social mobility. However, on our side of the house, when you give this chance to those millions and millions of children, this, on our side of the house, we have those people who yeah. will ca ca contribute, who will make, of, make all, of the, all of those things. And at the end of this debate, on both sides of the house, you have some economical development, you have some incentive because people adjust, because people de uh, develop. But the question is, who should we prioritize? Who should we give rights? I think it's not the opening opposition. Uh, uh, opposition. I think OG uh, beats this case. Therefore, uh, proud to propose. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister for that speech. I invite the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to close the debate on the opening half. So, can I? Okay, so I should put the stopwatch a second for myself. And yeah, so here we go. Mr. Chair, two things in my speech, mainly about the left obs obsession with radical redistribution of wealth, because note, OO does not oppose a welfare state. We already have that in the West, even in the US, where people proclaim that the, the situation is really bad. I mean, 30% of the GDP is nationalized, and there is redistribution. So the question is whether it should be radical or not. And that is the burden that uh, uh, first government is running from. Secondly, uh, uh, 
Okay, I'll get to that actually. So I'm go mainly going to talk about why we will have much less of a cake to actually give welfare to people and why this would be a harm actually to the poor people inside the countries, not only the people that acquired their wealth in a legitimate way, as my partner told. But let's see some parts of free battle. So they come up to, say, to us and says, but note, uh, it, this was acquired, on, it, this is like slavery, and thus this is illegitimate. A, ignoring my partner's explanation why it was acquired legitimately due to the fact that your children and are extension of yourself and thus people should be allowed to give them their, their money and ignoring the, uh, uh, the explanation why this is a huge example, a, a incentive for people to work. B, they come up to the town and say, but note people will have uh, various different ways for pursuit of happiness and the perception of happiness will change and thus money is not that important. If money weren't important, why are you coming for it? So this is like just a euphemism of that. In addition to that, they say, but note they will have much more mobility and throughout we will prosper more and people will be able to invent more stuff. A, think the mobility on, uh, 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 on the West is in a fine situation. Uh, 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 B, in addition to that, we don't think that the main problem is less of a mobility because we think that the genie uh, or the global uh, uh, genie is actually uh, 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 being reduced and we have less of uh, 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 inequality throughout globally. This happens due to comparative advantage, which enables uh, 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 like uh, people in Africa and in China to lift themselves out of poverty. We have never got an explanation, and my partner asked with, whether sh this would be global or not, never given an answer regarding that. So let's talk mainly about incentive. Why would this would be bad for the people and for the poor? poor people specifically. So I, we know that the absolute poverty in the world have shrunk drastically. And the, uh, as I said before, the inequality globally is being uh, reduced. We only see a small rise in inequality in the West and, and, and thus the, the succession of the middle class in, in the West for radical redistribution. We think that this would be really bad because this won't be on a universal global level and thus we would see uh, just money fl flow uh, uh, running away from your country just like happened in France which exactly made the proposition 70% on President Hollande turn and the money just went away r running and fleeing out of France and thus they would just uh, uh, needed uh, to change that later on uh, and they're still suffering from low uh, growth in France due to that. In addition to that, we just see the strong people inside your country moving away, not just the money of the really uh, strong people, the 1%, we even see the 10 percent, the really smart people moving away, mainly to other countries with low rate of taxation and so on. And we think this would be really bad actually for uh, countries of disadvantaged people that nowadays are being able to, compu uh, to compete in the market through low taxation and, uh, and that comparative advantages. So it would be bad for the global poor in the world. In addition to that, and my partner already started that, the fact that in order to have growth, we need to take risks. So uh, first of all, government says, but note, you still have to work and to sustain your family. And you still have enough incentive to work. So a few things on that. A, we think that nowadays, especially on low uh, uh, growth level, as we have since the big crash in 2008, and as Larry Summers and others say, that the West is going into a condition of low growth that is constant. In order to beat that uh, and to take uh, care of the debt that all those countries have, we need to have really high growth. In order to achieve that, we need to take much more risk into the economies. That's why, like they're lowering the rate uh, uh, tax, uh, 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 the rate interest, and so on, in order to actually incentivize people to invest money. In order to have that, we need to have really big margin for people to take that risk and to uh, and to put money in research and development, which is becoming much more uh, expense nowadays because we have already taken the easy fruits that we can take out of the trees in order for, to reach for the, the ones that are on the top of the tree, you need to have loads of money in order to, to do that. And for that to happen, you need people to have really good incentive to invest that money and to put themselves uh, and the, in, in the situation situation in risk. In addition to that, we think that we have today a lot of philanthropy, which, which isn't enough, but we, th but we think that the philanthropy being done by, by the 1%, it's much more uh, 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 
uh, effective than the one being done by governments and the redistribution which give the money usually directly to the people, people that, that, that come from situation in which they don't know how to handle the money, they usually spend it and rather than keeping it and investing it in, into the economy which leads to less growth, growth when you don't invest in your money and so on. In, in comparative to, for example, Bezos $10 billion giving to fight climate change, or Bill, Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Warren Buffett, which like a lot of billionaires are, are, are uh, 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 saying that they would donate most of their money into that. So before I continue, second engagement. Okay, so I assume they agree with us. So. Uh, 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 where, where was I? So yeah, as I was saying, so we think that the uh, inequality in the world is being reduced right now, but what's, what's more important thing is that we think that when we have a much bigger cake, we can give more to the poor people inside the world. I think it's much better for you to be a poor people in the Scandinavian rather to be like a middle class in Cuba, which is which is a cliche, but, but it's definite, definitely true. So we'd rather have that. So let's sum up this debate. We think that a no direct engagement rather than only saying inheritance isn't okay to our case, why this money was, was acquired legitimately. And mainly because we think that the global poor would be really harmed in a situation where we don't have enough incentive and when we have low growth in the economy. And that is the situation in which we don't have enough money to sustain the country, to give the, to give the public goods and redistribute the money and thus more than happy to oppose. Thank you. I thank the DLO for that speech. I would now like to invite the member of government to open the debate for the closing half. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Right. Good. Uh, so first I would like to say thank you for the previous speakers and the speakers that will uh, join our game. So I would like also to uh, rebut a little bit the previous speaker's speech and then uh, so I think our uh, extensions, they're based on rebutting of the previous speeches points. So the first thing is like what we're saying, uh, I think we didn't came to the real understanding about the incentive, what motivates people. So, and what our, our side uh, is saying is that incentives is very important and probably that's uh, the thing that moves people. That's what we feel. So therefore we wanted to say that people can do other jobs and feel satisfied and uh, that's uh, enough for just for being incentive for one person or for another person and we feel that uh, that's not only the thing that it gets so we're sh we're thinking that it's good when uh, when uh, some people they're getting more money we're uh, saying that uh, other people wouldn't get just extra money that cannot help them significantly because uh, just people around the world they're just getting uh, uh, that just uh, when, when you have one million dollar so you don't care so it, it doesn't make any just improvement for you if you're just taking another million dollar I mean but if you give uh, share this one million dollar to other two two thousand people so it will be much much better and so uh, and uh, I think that's uh, about incentive the, th the, the thing about incentive is that also uh, that we have uh, we now we have the lack of incentives because people who don't have this money on earth so that they uh, have to they're like in a poverty trap they have to work hard and they have no uh, their only incentive that just to make money for their living and if even if those people who are just making uh, big money and it's their real incentive if we just are uh, like uh, with a with, with the proposal with the proposal of government, if we reduce the money uh, they can uh, get and uh, just uh, share this uh, and invest this money in like healthcare, start businesses, uh, colleges, so it will increase the general incent incentive. So more people they will become motivated because now they're not motivated, they're not they're not and they're not happy with life. And even if those people that are not motivated. Uh, even those uh, rich people who are motivated right now, they will just a bit uh, decrease their motivation. Uh, so the whole, the general motivation of the whole society will uh, will will be increased. 
and uh, so uh, and I would like also to uh, to present our extension. I think that's the extension that's when we can look at the history and think how the things are developing. So our extension it all comes to uh, it all comes about the future. So the first thing is that. Uh, so we will, we will uh, present our two points. The first point is that the times are changing and uh, the current uh, and people who are just like, uh, 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 and people who are becoming richer at this moment, they're becoming uh, richer because they monopolize something. So uh, as we meet uh, the IT sphere, we are seeing that it's better, uh, uh, so it's becoming, uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the number of people that, have, uh, that are having the power, having the money, it's increasing year by year, which is, uh, goes to the contradiction of the, uh, of the previous speaker's speech. We're seeing that a lot of people that are becoming richer and this 1% of the richest people that are like, uh, uh, getting uh, more, uh, more power and more money in their health, uh, in, their, in their wealth. So uh, we can say that, uh, uh, in the future, if we will leave uh, just like the money and power for those people uh, who, who are just having this one, we, uh, we, we will not be able to provide with the necessary services to other people. So that's why we need radical changes. And that's why we're still thinking about the radicals. And uh, 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 the previous speakers also said that the philanthropy is more efficient way, but we can say that people who are like uh, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, they just don't sharing their ideas. They don't share the technologies to other people. Yeah, they're just giving small amount of money. Uh, I mean, there was so that leads that they will still control the power, and people who don't have the money, even if they get the money from Bill Gates. Uh, they will not be able to uh, just to affect the life. Uh, they will not be able to uh, to uh, to get some education and so on and so forth. Yeah, and so we're thinking that uh, the few uh, that uh, just the time flies uh, flies and it's it's becoming uh, just like more important for us to. Uh, to let people to uh, just to, to, to separate there and to to to, to build our uh, to build more uh, more equal world. So uh, can you tell me about the time? Or <laughs> okay. So and the uh, the second thing is about uh, like uh, the equal. Uh, why it is important? Uh, okay. Why it is important? I think that it's uh, the second point of us. It, it, that's very important because of. Uh, 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 because of inequality in the future, like we, that will be uh, that will be uh, caused by genome editing, etc., etc. So what we th what we think is that when when you reach people, so you can influence your health, you can improve your health, you can even become uh, uh, become uh, deathless. And so we can we can uh, guarantee that people that are rich they will have the power to do this, and those people who are poor they will not be able uh, to do uh, to uh, they will not have the access to these uh, to these things. So we think that it will not be like the big pipe as a big cake as the previous speaker said. It will be just another thing that uh, can uh, just increase the inequality. Uh, to the big, uh, to the real uh, big, uh, big, like amounts, and uh, so we think that uh, we should uh, we should deal with this. So uh, apparently, I would like to sum up that we are facing the future, and we have two points. The first point is like uh, that it's require it's requirements of time because inequality now it's just uh, it was caused by uh, the monopolies, and this monopolies will grow. And the second point is that future inequality uh, can uh, happen with the new technologies like biotechnological gene, gene addition that will lead and increase the inequality itself. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. I thank the member of government for that speech and I invite the member of the opposition to continue this debate. Thanks. <clears throat> so several answers to the case of the 
of the closing government. They tell about monopolies that makes people deprived of any possibilities. We believe there's nothing bad in it because we have trickle down effect when people creating great monopolies with big uh, economies and big factories creating services for people, creating jobs for these people, creating cheap technologies that become cheaper and cheaper as time goes, creating more possibilities for even poor people to have access to these technologies or have access to some basic jobs, like for example, work at the warehouse of Amazon. This means that even if in some, in some years more monopolies will be created, poor people will still have access to some basic goods and to be able to satisfy their basic needs due to the reason that these big monopolies will still need workers and people involved in their business in order to uh, gain money and in order to uh, create even bigger supplies of their wealth. However, this will not happen on uh, uh, the side of, of the government house. And we will show why their uh, level of poverty will be even increased. Second uh, uh, thing about genome editing and uh, anything else available only for rich people, we believe that this harm is still unproved and uh, the stratification that will, that will happen on our side of the house and the discrimination that will end up in more criminal activity is much uh, worse uh, impact than uh, the some kind of genome editing. So what we are talking about? We are talking about uh, the stratification that will increase over time because people will now perceive poor as some kind of robbers who take uh, the money from them and deprive them from some uh, basic opportunity that they would like to have. We are not talking about only rich people or the richest people of this world. We believe that middle class is also engaged in this activity. And we believe that both rich and poor uh, form the majority of this society. And we will make the majority of this society hate poor people and uh, will remove any incentives from them in order to help those people. So what will happen with rich people? Now rich people get social credits for uh, helping poor, for creating some funds, for donating money to some uh, institutions then, that then create some programs for poor, for their education, for their jobs, uh, for their welfare. Now, when we have this radical redistribution of wealth, rich people uh, now do not have any social credits for this thing, meaning that they do not want to donate, do not want to help, do not want to engage in any helping activity towards poor. This means that they uh, will, will now be fully disincentivized from lob lobbying some programs or for voting for programs that create some benefits for uh, poor people because now they, will, don't, they won't get uh, any positive impact for themselves. What is more, we believe that uh, uh, these uh, rich people, they now have all instruments to lobby and this is what a opening governments is talking about, but we believe that in uh, their world, these rich people will have even more incentive to lobby some laws that will uh, protect themselves and not the poor people, because they will perceive poor people as the ones who take uh, the wealth from them and do not allow them to live their happy and wealthy life. However, we believe that backlash from middle class will be even greater. First of all, because middle class is uh, a more uh, quantitative group. There are more people who have some kind of middle incomes uh, in their life. We believe that the perception of poor as a robust will be even worse for these people because uh, now they won't be able to afford some uh, additional things like, for example, education for their son, or they won't be able to buy uh, a car or buy a house that is necessary for their family in order to live comfortable. So now, if, if now when they pay taxes, they do not perceive it, perceive it as robbery because this is a little part of their salary and they still can educate their children they still can buy houses and uh, any other property uh, in future when this radical redistribution happens they will be able to afford only some basic goods for their welfare meaning that they uh, won't be able to see their products of their uh, work uh, and they will think about uh, the poor clarification uh, uh, yes even in a status quo in Europe, large majority of middle class not own their houses but pay rents at a very high prices. And therefore, this is the status quo that you talk about. That they don't have money to education, but in our world, they will. Uh, they still won't have this money for education because even, even 
if now they have to pay rent, tomorrow when they have also to redistribute the wealth they worked for, uh, for poor people, this means that they will have close to none uh, opportunities to get out of uh, this low middle class and to get uh, even more possibilities in the future. And even if some poor people will get help out of it, we believe that making a great group of middle class poor and making them suffer more. This is the reason that they cannot afford themselves uh, the product they worked for for a long time and worked honestly for a long time is not just for them. What is more, we believe that they will still believe that this is unjust toward them and they will start hating those poor people. What this means for us? This means that uh, they won't vote for parties that create social programs for poor. They won't, uh, uh, the this means that politicians who would like to be re-elected won't uh, uh, accept this as part of their programs. This means that poor are no more uh, the theme uh, to be discussed in Parliament. No special policies will be uh, created for them. Like, for example, budget education or uh, some opportunities to buy a cheaper housing. This means that uh, these poor will have the only possibility to get, wealthier, uh, sorry, to, uh, get wealthier is to have this money redistributed. And we believe that uh, they won't be able to use this money efficiently. Uh, uh, last reason why we believe that this impact is very serious is because it increases domestic discrimination. Now when I hate the person, I know the person who took my money and I know what is the reason of why my son can not get an education. Now I hate these people. This means that I, for example, won't get, uh, won't give raise for these people uh, if I get them on a job, or won't take them on a job if I have other choice. Uh, we will have more radical groups who will spread their uh, influence. Uh, showing how these poor people uh, make other people poor and make other people suffer. This means that more criminal the criminal activity will still exist, but now it will be based not on the poverty, but on discrimination, making uh, poor people not only endangered to some absence of basic goods, but also endangered to crimes based on hatred. And this is even worse for them because now they do not have any safety at all for them. We will also have less investigations of crime committed towards poor people because people will not have any incentive to protect this group of people because government is somehow protecting them when it redistributes uh, the wealth. Based on all these reasons, we, we beg you to oppose. Thank you. Okay, I thank the member of the opposition for that speech and I will invite the government whip to conclude the debate for the side of government. Okay, I start. Uh, first, uh, first of all, I want uh, to make uh, a rebuttal uh, because um, opposition tells us like that the rich will not voluntarily help poor if we implement our bill, but in fact, we have already explained that um, very small, yes, some rich people, uh, they uh, help uh, like poor people, but their number is very small, so it's basically insignificant. We are talking about uh, uh, more rich people, so it's more important. It's more important that uh, money from a uh, bigger number of rich people would be distributed to poor people. Uh, then um, uh, to define who, which team won this debate, we need to answer a couple of questions. First question is like, if we implement this bill, will this bill improve uh, so-called situation of lottery of life when like uh, some people are born in uh, poor families, some people are born in rich uh, families, and this uh, two like uh, babies, they have different opportunities in life already from the very beginning of their life. So uh, we believe that closing government have proved that implementing this bill would really help to improve this, uh, would correct the situation of lottery of life. Um, because uh, we would create conditions where uh, children uh, who uh, in status quo are born in poor families in a status future, they would have better opportunities for education, uh, for basic needs, like for health care. Uh, so like um, opposition tells us like that um, uh, it's unfair to actually um, uh, 
uh, taken away from people who are working hard. But we are not uh, saying that we would take uh, money away from people who are working hard because our bill concerns only their children. So if you work hard, you earn money and, like, and you have this money. Uh, we are talking about 70% uh, of inherent, um, uh, inheritance tax, which is like if you are born this like 70% uh, of what you inherited are taken away from you. So it's from children who, uh, we are taking this money from children who didn't earn this money. And we don't touch their parents who are working hard, please enjoy your money, it's okay for you. Um, also, we are talking like if we are helping uh, poor children, we are again talking about millions of people, billion, billions of people in the world. And uh, we take this money only from uh, one or two percent of population. So uh, numbers are on our side, on the side of, um, of um, government. Also, we need to answer the question like what is better for market and growth? Uh, as our position tells us that like um, um, people uh, would, would not have uh, uh, incentive to work hard. So you wouldn't start like startups or businesses. But again, um, there is a mistake here because we are not uh, talking about taking everything away from them. We are talking about 70% of tax. So this these people, they still have 30%. They still have incentive to work for money. Yes, they wouldn't have earned a lot, like much, but still their incentive to improve their, their well-being is still there. And also, no thanks, no questions. Uh, also, like if we believe like for market, like if more people have uh, initial capital, uh, they would uh, use this capital uh, to make attempts to launch their projects, to launch their businesses, their, their startups. And the more attempts uh, made uh, by people to launch their businesses, the more successes are there. So actually, this is much better for market. Our position tells us like that it would uh, ruin growth. But uh, opposition doesn't explain why growth is good because in fact we see that growth might be bad because uh, it uh, leads to more pollution in the world. Uh, but even if we agree that growth is, let us assume that growth is good, uh, still like um, uh, our bill wouldn't like uh, ruin the growth because um, uh, the more money people have, uh, the more uh, money people spend on consuming uh, various products, uh, very, uh, various goods. And if people spend more, it's good for economy because uh, this is the blood of econ economy. People spend more money, uh, companies and businesses have uh, to actually produce more stuff. So actually it doesn't ruin growth. And, that? and also if rich people, uh, if rich people have money and they spend it only like uh, on rich stuff, poor people spend it on various stuff. Uh, so, uh, um, also, like uh, on our side, we have like the the government says like our our um, uh, bill would uh, help to improve to reduce poverty and crime, and it explained like why. Uh, but our closing uh, opposition makes a point that uh, what's more important is not to reduce actually uh, poverty and crime, but to bring uh, poor people on the board of making decision uh, of decision making. Uh, because like if you redistribute money uh, to uh, more or less equally between people, uh, all people, uh, like poor people would have uh, more say in decision making because um, uh, money increases their power. And we believe it's more important um, uh, to bring uh, poor people on uh, in, into decision making process because if they are there, they are already would solve the issues of crime and poverty. Because these people, they would think like what is good for them too. They are also also will be represented. That's why we believe it's much more important. Like uh, of course, reducing poverty and crime is important, but it's more important uh, to provide uh, poor people or less dis disadvantaged people uh, with power of decision making and uh, um, to create a situation where they are better represented. Because thus they would like uh, um, automatically solve like issues with crime and poverty. Uh, also, what we are saying is that, like, um, uh, just a second. 
uh, at the moment in status quo, uh, disadvantaged people are exclude, excluded from the process of decision making. So overall, like what we see here is that like after implementing this bill, we will have lots of um, uh, very good stuff: reduction of poverty, reduction of crime, bringing poor people uh, on uh, into process of decision making, and um, um, that's why we believe that like uh, the um, uh, government side um, won this debate. Yeah. Uh, still have time? Uh, I, I think my time is up, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, time's up. Okay, I thank the uh, government whip and would now like to invite the opposition whip to conclude this debate as a whole. One second. Okay, then firstly, I'll start with answering the government side. We believe that government fails uh, all the governments fail at explaining why this measure will be effective at all. Because what they tell you is that those people will have possibilities, but they don't actually explain why those people will use those possibilities in, and why if they use those possibilities, those possibilities will be successful. So some more constructive uh, answers on the rebuttal here is that firstly, we believe that the poor people, if they fail right now, they fail because of the reasons like the, the lack of the talent or simply because they don't want to because of the many reasons because they don't have that self-consciousness to understand that they have to work or they have poor backgrounds etc etc so this is important because this doesn't change at all when they we give them those opportunities that means even if they go and create some businesses they do not have any talent to make that business work and though it will fail in the later side or they will not go and create that business at all because they don't really want to understand don't understand what they do need uh, to do that. But secondly, is that those people are actually used to spend their money and what they get from social benefits programs to fast happiness, like the alcohol or maybe like the drugs, because this is the thing that they're used to. So that means the money that they will get, they won't be spent on the things like education. And uh, the government side doesn't explain us that. But thirdly, we tell you that if the hatred will exist, that my teammate explains you about, that means even if they will have those uh, desires to actually go and work, they want, uh, they, they will get the hatred from the people on their job. And that means they will want, for example, get promoted on the job because the, your manager doesn't want you to get promoted because he understands that you uh, take money for, from him and from the, uh, from the company and from the other people. For, that means he will find some explanations why you couldn't be promoted because he don't really want to. And this is not a thing that you uh, later on, please, that you cannot uh, really find and understand somehow. So that means they won't, go, they won't get those benefits. But firstly, we do not believe that the impact of the government side is that big because we do not feel like those people really uh, need some, uh, like th their basic needs are not, uh, are not getting uh, right now because we uh, talk mostly about the democratic states where a lot of the social program benefits uh, programs are working right now. So that means those people getting their uh, social benefits that can actually make them get their basic needs right now. So therefore, for, we do not feel like those people are really suffering or a lot of those people suffering right now. But firstly, we believe that uh, it uh, because that redistribution will be redistributed among the, uh, a lot of the amount of the people, we feel like this won't be really uh, effective because even if we take a lot of the money from those rich people and the median class, it's still not enough to actually uh, maybe uh, make uh, happiness for all the people to make each Question. job possible. 
responsible for those people or to give credits for all those people simply because this is not uh, later on I will take because this is not a big amount of the money that we can get because there are a lot of the people who we need to re redistribute those things to so that means that we'll get only a small amount of money from those uh, re redistribution programs so that means there will be still a lot of the people who won't get uh, for example the possibility to go to university and study there because uh, we didn't create uh, all the places for those people and that means the people some of the people will still suffer in their case but what we explained to you in the comparative is that uh, there, there will be, will be uh, sufferings for those people for all the time for now I will take uh, opening no 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 question. closing okay the ones who ask no questions okay so we talked to you that the pressure that those minorities will feel will be uh, uh they will feel that pressure all the time and this is uh, also comparative to the opening opposition side because they tell to you only the cases about the businessmen or the companies where those companies will uh, not work or for example will fail and therefore some people will suffer but we explained to you the case where each of those minorities for example the black people or the poor people People, we suffer, suffer each day from the hatred that comes to them from the people that now will be hating them. So my, my teammate explains to you that hatred in three uh, key respects. Firstly, is that they still lose a lot of the things that they would need to actually benefit from their life, for example, like uh, making their kids go to university. Secondly, is they start perceiving those people as a robber, as a robbers, because they steal uh, my money for them that they actually uh, that they actually earned uh, and that they spent a lot of the time to actually do this. But thirdly, is because some also nationalists will emphasize on this on the TV, showing how the people are suffering when they lose their factor, uh, losing their jobs, and therefore can uh, can't actually get some money to probably get uh, things that they want to. So this leads to things like uh, people getting killed, for example, like in Russia, where the hatred uh, may be, uh, is, is higher than the democratic states because they, uh, f they have in the democratic states, other democratic states, I mean, those uh, empathy cases. Therefore, this is uh, dying of those people is a much higher impact than the opening opposition tells you in matter of only those companies losing, uh, not, not creating and not existing in the society. Uh, therefore, we also believe that the impact of the open opposition is not uh, e existing in all, in all the cases because the government side tells to you that we won't be reduced to taking all the money from the rich and probably we will, uh, they will have some money. Uh, we will only take the extra money that they will have. For example, the Bill Gates have a lot more money than he'd need to actually, for example, make him, his business work. Therefore, we do not believe that the impact of the losing those companies is as big because those uh, th those people still have the money that they can actually spend on investing. In, in the comparative, our impact of the hatred, it exists for all the people in the society, that. The, from, for the medium class that is big, that will actually lose their jobs now and they will feel that hatred for, for, towards the minorities. Therefore, those minorities will uh, every day uh, take uh, and uh, get that uh, sufferings from discrimination on the domestic level, from the discrimination on the job level. Therefore, we talk about a lot more cases in, 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 in a lot more scale of the society. Therefore, we have to win. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that debate as a whole. Uh, I'm going to retire now to adjudicate. I will probably be back with my call in 10 to 15 minutes, so be ready when that happens. Okay, everyone, the uh, call is ready, so I'm just going to check if all the teams are here. Opening government, are you both here? Yes. Yes. Opening opposition, are you both here? Yeah. Closing government? Yes. yes. And closing opposition? Yes. Yeah, closing opposition is here. Yeah. Both of you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
Uh, okay, so the way this is gonna go is I'm gonna give you the call, I'm gonna explain why the call was as it was, and then I'm trying to give you short individual feedback. If you want more individual feedback, or if something's not clear, you can always contact me on Facebook under my name and surname. Uh, so the call is as follows. I give the first to opening government, second to opening opposition, third to closing opposition, and fourth, unfortunately, to closing government. Here are the reasons why the call went as it did. First of all, a general, just a general piece of individual feedback, uh, general feedback. I think that the, the case in this debate was very unclear in terms of what radical redistribution of wealth would mean. I'm not sure that what open government defined as being radical is indeed all that too different from today's welfare state apart from it being a little bit stronger welfare state. I also think oppositions did not do much to challenge it. They did say oppositions running away from the burden. They never explained what they thought the burden should be and how a system of radical distribution would look in terms of policies. So what happened was the definition of opening government was pretty much left standing at the end of the debate. I think a lot more work could have been done to flesh out what you think that could have been. I'm going to talk about talk more about that when I get to individual feedback. Now on the call, the opening government defines this as they say, okay, first of all, we're going to have a large inheritance tax. Secondly, we're going to return control of the factories to the people, at least to a certain extent, to expropriation mechanisms of the state. Thirdly, we're going to have a lot of welfare programs or infrastructure programs. We're going to provide roads, going to provide healthcare, going to provide education, stuff like this. The two points they run here are very basic. One is generally the people who find themselves on the top of the social ladder do not deserve that for two reasons. One, they very often inherit their social position. So the lottery of birth has placed them in a better position than the majority of other people. Two, even elements just talent or luck are things that you did not necessarily deserve through your work. They're simply a consequence of a number of circumstances which are not related to your labor or the effort that you put in. And then practically they say this will simply provide more opportunities for more people because more money means more services, more infrastructure, and so on and so forth. The opening opposition case here is they concede the benefits of opening government. They say we agree that this is going to lead to more benefits. We're going to argue this on the legitimacy level. We're going to say that given the right to private property, this is not a fair thing to do. The right to private property has its grounds in a number of things. One, in your labor that you invested into acquiring this property. So it's not just luck and talent, it's also your, your hard work. Secondly, is the idea that your property is part of your identity. And thirdly, is the idea that your property allows for some autonomy. So the more property and capital you have, the more control over your life you have, therefore you're able to control the circumstances you exist in. That's generally a good thing. They do have a practical point. This is the point of investment, how investment is going to decrease at the point where people become more risk averse because they either have no reason to invest because the state is taking away their wealth or they feel insecure in investing for pretty much the same reason. How do these two things interact? On the point of legitimacy of this policy, I think that the opening opposition lacks a specific comparative in that at the point when they say that everyone should have the right to autonomy, which comes out of private property, then notably this autonomy extends to everyone in society. Then at the point where especially the deputy prime minister makes the claim that some people who might have the talent, which opening opposition says is a very important part of acquiring capital, do not have the capability or the position to ever utilize this talent to produce something for society, to invent and to then have this judged by society as some product or good. This then means that a certain amount of people are excluded in the first place a priori from the same right to autonomy that opening opposition claims extends to everyone. So the same extent to which a rich person has a right to their private property, a poor person has the right to try to acquire that private property. So it's very hard to compare the principle on both sides of the house. Then what the comparative becomes at that point is where do we have a greater balance of principle, which is the point where the opening government says, and it follows from their model, given it's obviously not a completely communist model, the people who have achieved their riches are still going to retain a certain amount of them. They're not going to lose the capability to control their lives. They're going to lose the capability to do that to a certain extent. But to the extent to which you have to provide for basic necessities and stuff, that is still going to be accounted for. And this is also true for the majority of the middle class, because their model is huge state programs of education, of healthcare, of infrastructure, things you need to be able to retain control over your life. So the majority of society still retains that to a significant extent. The comparative is that people who are excluded and have no other opportunity to access this in any way now get to access this. So the balance of principle 
probably exists more on the open government side because the people who had more riches are now excluded to a certain extent but still have some of the most basic and essential forms of control. The people who never had any now get at least some. Given that the opening opposition principle is never explicitly compared to the claims on opening government, they probably win this claim. I think there's also an extraneous point to the identity thing, which is where I think that opening government does provide at least some incentives why the way uh, our moral frameworks, our norms, our definition of success shape up are going to change. They say, obviously, when you have more redistribution, there are other motivations for for working and for behave, behaving socially that come to the forefront, which is like gaining societal respect, feeding your family, contributing to your community or whatever. This is likely to shift towards those kinds of norms and those kinds of goals rather than money when the world globally changes. The only response from opening opposition is, yeah, but if money is not important, then why are you running after it? But that premise is true in the status quo. If this policy is global, as opening government does explicitly say, in an answer to your POI, although you claim they don't, their answer to your POI is, well, look, pr probably all countries in the world are going to do this with different policies. We think most of them are going to follow our policy, but they say this is going to be global. If this happens globally, probably then the, the framework of norms shifts to a certain way. So one, I'm not sure why it's so important to have, the, to have property simply because it's part of your identity. Two, I think that to a certain extent it's going to be less part of your identity. On the practical level, I think that although opening opposition does talk about investments, the reason why they explain these investments are important is primarily because they provide services. To the extent to which the opening government says that these services still exist, they're just externalized to the government and provided for free under a public system, these services still exist, which means that the opening government turns this into a wash. The way for opening opposition to win this would be to explain why it would be far more inefficient when done by the public sector rather than by the private sector, or be to explain why inherently countries with strong redistribution policies tend to be more corrupt, more inefficient, stuff like this. This analysis was signposted as in saying it will happen, but it did not happen. So at that point, given that the practical is mostly a wash, the principle is more fulfilled by opening government. And they also can co-opt a little bit of the practical by saying, look, if we raise up more people who have talent, maybe more inventions are going to spring up. I think that on those grounds, opening government wins this debate. Closing government. My issue with closing government is that the majority of the things that they say are their extension are largely derivative and predicated on the opening government. They say they're going to have two extensions. The first is rebuttaling OO better than OG does. The second is an extension about what happens in the future, how the times are shifting, and how in order to provide for our society, its necessities and services in the future, we need to adjust through these redistribution policies. The problem with this is the majority of this is heavily predicated on OG. So analysis such as saying, people who do not have money do not have incentive to work or to produce anything because they do not have the position or predisposition to do so, is very explicitly in OG. The analysis of how rich people get to have more autonomy and control because they have the excess money is explicitly in OG. The analysis of how we're not going to take all of their riches, just the excess riches, which we do not think that they need for their lives, is explicitly in OG. I mean, specifically, the model is exactly, is exactly that, that, that what you're saying here. So the problem is it was very hard to identify a specific addition in contrast to the OG case. And even this point about the future is simply a reframing of what was already said. So you claim it's important to create some adjustments and some benefits for the future. Those benefits are specifically the benefits that opening government mentions. Benefits such as providing more services, providing more infrastructure, providing an opportunity for poor people to raise themselves out of poverty and actually have those basic necessities. You simply take all of these and say, we need them for the future. So you add a timestamp to this. I'm not sure what the, what the difference is, nor specifically did you try to explain that in your speeches at any point. It's very hard to rate you against opening government. Rating you against opening opposition. The first issue is obviously that you do not have any new responses to opening opposition as compared to opening government, which means that you do not contribute to government bench winning this clash. Formatively, you, it's very hard to beat a team on the opposition by repeating rebuttal that come, came out of first half, even if that rebuttal was efficient. But even excluding that, on the clashes where you choose to clash with opening opposition, and you mostly clash on opening opposition, one, on the idea that you're still going, that you're going to get some kind of investments, and two, on the idea of the principle, you provide substantially less answers 
than opening government does, which also means that you're less likely to beat opening opposition. Because on the point of investments, what you generally say is, we do not take away the majority of people's money. They still have some money. This is not an explanation as to why they will invest. The mechanisms opening opposition provides is not how much money people have. It's A, whether they think they're going to be able to retain that money, and B, given the general circumstance within the state, whether they feel secure to invest that money, which they do not because the state is likely to take away that wealth. That is something you guys do not deal with. Opening government does not deal with it explicitly, but it has some kind of explanation as to why the importance of investments is in providing services and we still have that and is in explaining how by raising more poor people out from the bottom we maybe get more inventions and more talent you guys simply say people will still have money that is not engaged directly with the reasons why opening government by opening opposition says they will not invest which means that to the extent to which you want to engage investments clash and therefore conceded investments are important you do not explain why investments still happen on the principle you do not have an explicit principle challenge the general thing you say is Rich people have disproportionately more autonomy. We need that autonomy to be redistributed to the poorer people. However, you do not have engagement on the claims of opening opposition, that this autonomy was earned primarily through hard work and through talent rather than through some kind of luck or lottery of birth. The engagement with this, the only principle engagement with this, exists in opening government, where they talk about how all of these things are simply a consequence of the lottery of birth, therefore undeserved. In order to engage in the principle, you have to provide something more. I felt you did not even engage with that explicitly. Now, why do you lose to closing opposition? This brings closing opposition into the debate. The extension of closing opposition is generally this. At the point where there is radical distribution, people are likely to antagonize the poor, right? They're likely to believe that the poor are robbers, that they are siphoning off welfare, siphoning off their hard-earned work which means that in treating poor people, poor people are less likely to get respect and therefore also less likely to get benefits that stem from respect. Things such as promotions, things such as political parties, standing for them and proposing poor friendly policies and stuff like this. Before I move on to explaining what the CEO extension, how does the extension rates towards opening half, let's just compare you guys to CG. The problem here is one, that CG does not offer an explicit response to the closing government extension at any point in their web. So even though I felt, and I'm going to explain this more, the closing opposition extension is very hard to impact. I, I'm not quite sure what the extent of the impact of hatred is going to be. It is some kind of impact, right? Some kind of stigmatization is asserted to be happening and some kind of consequences in the workplace and stuff like this are going to exist. The extent to which that claim exists and has some amount of substantiation from CO, a lack of explicit response from closing government means that this is simply left standing. That, in combination with the fact that I have no substantial addition from closing government in terms of benefits, means that CO has harms, whereas CG does not have a specific benefit to contrast to this. The second thing which is problematic is that a lot of the responses given to the member of opposition by the government whip are responses which directly contradict the government model, right? So a response which happens numerous times is saying, we are not going to touch the parents. We're only going to touch the children. We're going to take away 70% of inheritance from the people who have gotten this inheritance. We don't touch anyone else. This is not opening government's model. Opening government very clearly states they want extensive redistribution programs through education and healthcare. They say they want a certain amount of control over production to be given to either the state or the people rather than the pri private owners, which obviously means you touch everyone, not just, not just the children. So this means that A, the responses from closing government to a lot of CEOs material outside of their extension are in tension with the open government model and therefore formatively very hard to rate. But also secondly, self-defeating in terms of closing government benefits because if closing government wants to claim the benefits of creating a better future as in providing a lot more services and a lot more infrastructure to a huge amount of people who are not the 1%, then if they claim that their policy is exclusively inheritance tax, even if I buy that, that would also mean that CG's benefits are incredibly diminished, where CO's harms are left untouched by CG, and this way CO takes over CG. Now, how does the CO extension rate in contrast to opening half? My problem here was it was incredibly hard to rate the impact of hatred as compared to other things. Numerous reasons for this. The first one is that the first chunk of your impacts regarding hatred, which is the poor are going to get less protection, they're going to get less laws, they're going to get less policies and stuff like this, is somewhat outside of the debate to the extent to which these policies and these kinds of protections are government fiat. 
So if radical redistribution is happening, then these policies are happening because they're part of radical redistribution. So government has fiat to say, and they do in their model, look, we're going, this is probably going to mean a, a redistribution to services through control of production and stuff like this. So that's fiat and within the motion. The second thing, which makes your extension very hard to rate, is that open government has an explicit engagement with this when they say the majority of the middle class already finds themselves in a very hard position with no money to spend and no control over their lives. If your mechanism for antagonization is going to be that they're going to lose exactly this, then a lack of response to this OGSPOI, apart from saying, yes, but this is additional money, means it's hard for me to quantify to what extent the middle class is going to be more disprivileged. I can accept they're going to be somewhat more disprivileged, but this also makes it hard to quantify the amount of hatred that's going to happen, specifically when you claim very large impacts, as in the poor are going to be excluded pretty much everywhere. So that's the second reason why I found it hard to rate your extension. I think that thirdly, the point on minorities is exclusively, like black people and stuff, is exclusively in the web. So the things that I can primarily rate are generally the idea of poor people being siphoners, siphoners of wealth. Uh, the reason why I think that loses to open government is primarily because open government's model, which is very clearly stated throughout their speeches and was not contested within the debate, impacts pretty much everyone but the rich. So the majority of redistribution is going to happen from the rich, not just to the poor, but also to the middle class and lower middle class. They say this in an answer to the POI, right? They say, obviously, this probably means a larger amount of taxes for the middle class as well. But this means a disproportionate large amount of services for the middle class as well. So probably, if no engagement is made to that specific point, that this also means more services, more infrastructure, more welfare for the middle class, open government has at least some kind of claim that this will cancel out, which makes it hard to rate the closing government extension as having substantial impact over this debate. And then at that point, opening government's impacts on a lot more people simply being materially included take the day because quantitatively and qualitatively, they are a larger impact than a relatively unquantified and hard to weigh concept of hatred. Why this loses out to opening opposition is primarily because the opening opposition principle is something that stands regardless of impact, right? So even if the poor people were not hated, even if the rich were to retain the majority of their wealth, even if they would not feel antagonized, this would still be an illegitimate thing to do, which is not to say that the practical argument cannot win over a principle, and obviously it can, but if the practical argument is not weighed sufficiently, then strategically a principled argument, which, was, which stands regardless of those practical impacts, at the point where I find it hard to, to gauge how big those practical impacts are going to be, is more persuasive in this sort of situation. The second reason, is, is because the practical benefits given by OO are more tangible and more quantified in saying, look, the entirety of the population is going to be impacted by the fact that a lot of services, which are consequence of private sector investment and private sector innovation, are now going to disappear for everyone. These services impact pretty much all sectors of life, right? So at that point, there is an impact which touches upon the majority of people in society. The reason why this loss to OG was because they did not prove, was because in contrast to OG claims, they did not show why we have less of this. But the reason why this takes over you guys is because this impact in and of itself, just comparing OO to CO, disregarding OG in this comparison, is an impact that is likely to affect a larger number of people. And it is clear what the mechanism is. The mechanism is services necessary for life. Whereas on closing opposition side, the mechanism of hatred either leads to impacts which are somewhat outside of this debate or is not quantified enough for me to be sure how large those impacts are going to be. So that's the reason the call went as it did. I'm now going to move on to do short personal feedback. Uh, before that, are there any additional questions? Cool. Okay, short personal feedback. Uh, okay, PM. Uh, so this is where I'm going to talk about defining these debates. I think what I feared might happen, and, and it kind of did happen, is opening government not completely fulfilling their burden. So obviously if it's a radical redistribution of wealth, it's radical compared to status quo. So this means significantly more radical than even the welfare states of Scandinavia. And I would buy that bullet. I would go fully radical. The first thing I would advise is it's always good to have an example, a real life example of where you think radical distribution happened. And an example would be, it would be nice if this example would be 
defendable. An example, I would potentially use would be Cuba. And I would go, look, these are the elements of radical distribution. And be very clear that this is not capitalism anymore. It doesn't have to be like Soviet Union, but it's not capitalism. I would say things like, one, this means expro huge expropriation of the wealth of the most wealthy. The state has control of the vast majority of wealth through, ex through exorbitant amounts of taxation. The state redistributes this to huge, broad programs like uh, vaccination programs, like free university tuition, like agricultural subsidies, like whatever. Secondly, this probably also means the expropriation of land. So as it did, for example, in Cuba, this means that you will provide compensation to large landlords, you will break up their estates, and you will redistribute these estates to people who apply for that redistribution largely. The, agri the average agricultural individual who has only a minor estate at which he cannot grow sufficient food and pro produce either to sustain himself or to sustain his family. This also probably means the expropriation of factories. So factories and enterprises now become state-owned. And the state, therefore, is the one who provides the majority of jobs, is the one who provides the majority of wages, and so on and so forth. So I would be very clear on that model. The second thing I would advise is that when, you, when you're trying to explain the principle and talk about how luck and talent are things that you do not deserve but you inherit, the question I was asking myself is, okay, but why does this only apply to rich people? So obviously, a poor person who was born with talent but was now excluded from being able to access society also did not work for their talent and did not deserve their talent. So if all talent is inherited and simply luck, why does a poor person deserve more of it than a rich person? I do not think this is what your case implied. I think it was very easy to read it as such because it lacked the analysis of, sure, everyone has talents inherited by luck. We said everyone should have an equal position to try to utilize those talents. And this is where the hard work comes in. Talent is inherited. Riches are inherited. The only way for hard work to shine through this is if everyone gets an equal position with the things they have inherited, this equal position <coughs> can only happen through our model. But this comparative needs to be explained specifically. The last thing I would add is that very often your impacts were not directly linked to the things that you mentioned in your model. So you provide a lot of broad impacts. We're gonna have education, we're gonna have healthcare, we're gonna have efficient infrastructure, more people are gonna have more money. You need to have direct analysis which explains how your model is directly going to lead to that. What are the mechanisms? And I would also add a preemptive analysis on why it's going to be efficient. Because what I expect it to come out of opposition, what I would run from opposition, is that when this is done by the public sector and by the state, it tends to be horribly inefficient. So I would add a preemptive analysis on why this is likely to work. Things such as, look, obviously, the people themselves still have recourse towards the state. The state still wants to prevent people from rioting, from revolting, and stuff like this. Secondly, democracy still exists. So even if there's a radical distribution of wealth, this does not have to mean a dictatorship. It still means different parties radically redistributing. So you still have control over how this is going to work so that people have some recourse. Thirdly, they announced that both say or run in that test final, right? So if the entire world is doing this, then a lot of the reasons why a redistributing state would fail no longer exist. The reason why a state which radically redistributes usually fails is because it gets isolated from the world market. It's not competitive in the world market because other countries tend then to have more like trade-friendly policies as compared to your huge, I don't know, profit taxes or whatever, which is something that opening up try to run when they say, look, in France, capital is running away because of high taxes. But if this happens globally, then that comparative disadvantage disappears because every state is doing this. So the framework changes. And the reasons of exclusion from the world market that are likely to make redistributing states fail no longer exist. But in order to do that, you need to be aware of the fact that your, mo your side of the motion is reframing the entire world. And try to actively make use of this. You can very preemptively say a lot of the things opposition is going to presume are important are not important or less important in a world where the entirety of the planet Earth and human civilization shifts the way that their economy works. The majority of things Op is going to say only work when one state tries to do this in a liberal capitalist world. That changes on our side of the house. So use the fact that you get to change the world and use it openly. Hello. Um, I think that it was maybe strategically imprudent to spend so much time explaining why inheritance is a good thing and inheritance is something that motivates you to work. 
I think that probably a better way to go around this would be to co-opt the opening government, the opening government principle, and simply go and explain, okay, if their problem is that these people do not deserve their position, and that the logic of their principle is the state needs to provide equality and equal respect. Here's why the respect is actually equal. Here's why these people deserve the wealth that they have, not necessarily, so even if we take OG at their best, not necessarily because they worked hard, not necessarily because they were so talented. I think you should have that analysis as well, and you did, but this is a good even if. The reason why they deserve the wealth they have is because it disproportionately provides things to society. And you have this argument when you talk about investments, but I would link it explicitly. I would say that at the point where the majority of innovations we use, the majority of technologies we use on a day-to-day -day basis, the majority of wages, the majority of workplaces are provided by the wealthy, the wealthy contribute to society more than the average middle-class person. So they have more wealth, but this wealth corresponds to the larger contribution they have. So if OG wants a treatment of equality, this is equal because the benefits that they have scale to the contribution that they have. And this is an even-if analysis which can avoid OG's claims on how this is undeserved because talent is something that's lottery of birth, not necessarily something, something you work hard for. Secondly, when you challenge, and this is also a, a comment on DLO, when you challenge open government on the fact that they run away from their burden and they're not supporting radical distribution, you need to say what, what you think radical distribution is, like what policies this is, going to, this is going to presume and why it's likely that it's going to be those policies. Because if you don't, that challenge does not defeat open government because it just says, we believe OG is not fulfilling their burden, which of course you do because you're OO and it's good for you to believe that, but you need to provide with an alternative definition. The last thing I would suggest is when you are running the uh, principal analysis on property, I think that the way to make that stronger would simply be to explain how the fact that this provides autonomy means that it's extremely important to you. So you say this provides control over your life. I would go and say, that without private property, there is absolutely no way for you to have a dignified life and have less private property. Why? Because the way we achieve happiness in life is by achieving a certain definition of happiness. Our definitions of happiness exceed our basic necessities, which means that in order to be happy, we don't just need to have food on the table. If we do not have the right to achieve private property, or if a lot of our private property is taken away, we will never have the capacity to achieve our own definitions of happiness because the resources we need to be happy are taken away from us, which means that our lives are not dignified because the only way for us to be happy is to pursue our definition of what we want to be in the future. To the extent which that definition is contingent on you having or at least working to have a certain amount of capital to invest in that definition, we preclude a huge amount of people from doing this in the first place. So we are not against the welfare state. We can support a Scandinavian model and give poor people a chance to compete. But if that comes at the expense of denying pretty much everyone a chance to achieve happiness and limit them to basic necessities, then no one ends up being happy. And then I would, and I would put it in that way because framing your principles to be about something that is very intuitively good for everyone, things such as happiness, things such as dignity, is a good advice for you guys to do. Okay. Uh, DPM. So my primary point of comment to you would be that I would like you to respond to the opening opposition more explicitly. So then a lot, a lot of points were, were, that you're explaining, I do not have an explicit reference to what the opening opposition is saying and what exactly are you trying to worry about. I would like to hear things such as when the opening opposition says this, the premise of their analysis is this. Here's why that premise doesn't stand. Pinpoint what is the analysis that you are trying to rebut and pinpoint what link, what mechanism in particular are you trying to take down. These kinds of explicit comparatives make it far easier for judges to follow what in particular you are doing at a specific point in time. The second thing that I would, tr I would try to, I would try to, uh, I would try to advise to you is when the opening opposition does call out the fact 
that this is not necessarily, in their opinion, a radical redistribution. Or when you see indications already in LO that they might do this, I would try to explain why this differs from the status quo. Uh, I think that's also an advice for PM. I think that's advice for government side in general. When a motion says something like radical or significantly or whatever, try to explain preemptively why this is so different from the status quo. Because I think that this preempts a lot of attacks coming from the other side about how this is not necessarily a radical relationship. DLO. So the first thing is the one I already said, and that is, okay, if you think that this is not a radical redistribution, do explain what is a radical distribution in your opinion. Secondly, I would advise you to just be very careful in reading the motion. I think, that, for example, your analysis on how capital is fleeing from France uh, is something that is not within the motion at the point where opening government says this is probably going to be done globally. So I think that a good advice for you would be to very closely listen to how the opening government team defines this debate. The third thing is on a very practical level, just in terms of advice for arguments, I would try to run an argument that says, look, the state is going to be horribly inefficient in doing this. The same thing such as like radical redistribution means that the majority of wealth is controlled by the state. When the majority of wealth is controlled by the state, this means that all of the incentives of a specific politician, of a specific official to be corrupt, are hugely magnified. And the only thing you depend on is hoping that the state is going to be just and the state is going to be fair in allocating this wealth. We cannot depend on the state to do that. And then you can call on very, very practical examples. The second thing is that you can explain that when radical redistribution happens, the thing that kicks in is a problem that the state has no profit incentives. This is a general argument when the state is less efficient at providing services. is because the state, I mean, it can go bankrupt, it can default, but it cannot go bankrupt the same way a company can. So the state does not have to make profit. The state has an incentive to frame these measures to be as populist as possible, to pander to the poor as much as possible, without this necessarily being economically efficient, with this money not being efficiently distributed, with this not necessarily contributing to more money being in the state's coffers, which is what the state is going to need in order to keep providing infrastructure. And the state may very well find itself strapped for cash. So I think a very good analysis would be that even if you agree with all the benefits from opening government, here's why they do not get them. Because I think it's not necessarily strategically prudent for you guys to say, we primarily argue this on legitimacy. I think I would rather go, we're going to argue this on both fronts. And then on the practical, not just argue investments, but also argue all of these things in general. Uh, member of government. So my formative feedback to you, apart from what I said in contrast to content, is do not say explicitly that your extension is going to be a rebuttal extension. Try to frame your extension as being something which is a positive contribution to the debate. Because if you explicitly say our extension is going to be a rebuttal, the message you're saying to the judge is, I don't have anything to say over OG. The only way you rate me is whether I can rebut OO better than they do. This also depends on what the call on opening half is, because a rebuttal extension is far more efficient if OO beats OG than if OG beats OO. Headline and say, we're going to extend on this. Secondly, try to make explicit differentiations to OG. So, the, so the, what an extension is, in essence, it's not just you trying to find something new. It's you trying to find something new and valuable. It's you trying to find something that the judge is going to hear and say, this, that's the thing I was missing. That's why I now believe the affirmative or negative side of this motion. That's the way you frame your extension in your mind. And that's what you're looking for. Tell me within the extension you're running, what is the specific point where I as a judge should say, yeah, that was the missing link. Identify the missing link and tell me explicitly why that's the missing link. Opening opposition, I think you suffer from pretty much the same problem. You say what your extension is, and I think you have much more of it than uh, closing government does, but my, my uh, um, feedback to member of opposition would be to try to A, compare it explicitly to OO, and B, try to quantify why these harms are larger than anything else in the debate. So you guys did not try to contend with the analysis from opening government that they're going to have more people included 
within society and more people having material benefits. And I think it's very hard to argue against that because OO explicitly concedes that. So if that happens, try to make an explicit comparison why even if more people are going to have formal access to education, here's why their quality of life will still get worse even though they can formally go to university. So that's the way I would frame the comparison. Be very explicit about, yes, open government has this and we concede. Here's how this gets worse. If you just say, look, this may lead to harms in jobs and them not getting promotions, you're not explicitly telling me why this is better or worse than them having more education or healthcare. I just know that there's a harm on your side and a benefit on government side and I'm left to weigh this up all on my own. That's less persuasive and less clear. On both whips. So the first thing I would say is be careful of about what was said in your extension, what you can add. So I already mentioned the point in minorities from op opposition whip. The government whip had a completely new idea on the poor being involved in decision making, which was not mentioned at all in the member. So be careful about what is new. If you really want to add something, new, if you think that it's very important, at least try to frame it as rebuttal. Try to find something on the other side that fits with the thing that you're trying to introduce and say, oh, look, the opposition is saying this. Our point fits perfectly as a response. Here's why it's a response. And then you can sneak in a lot of new material, but you cannot do that so explicitly if it's not something mentioned in extension. The second thing I would try to posit is more responsiveness to the team that's sitting opposite you. So I think both CG and CO don't really do a lot of explicit rebuttal to each other. I think that's problematic. It would have been even more problematic if it were a close in half debate, for example. I know that it's very hard to follow three teams at once. I think the, re the way you tackle this is through splitting of duties within the team. So if you're, I don't know, CG whip and you have to listen to CO extension, you tell your partner, I'm now listening to CO extension and I have to do rebuttal to CO extension please write me how you would want me to whip your extension. Or please write me new rebuttal to OWO if you have some. So split the duties in your team. Or conversely, if you're CG whip and you think OWO is winning, for example, and you want to do rebuttal to OWO, you tell your partner, please listen to CU extension, notify me if they're saying something relevant, and help me do rebuttal to this. But I think rebuttaling the team opposite you is very important, specifically specifically in the web, because you are the only speech that can respond to the team opposite you. And that's more true for government, because on opposition, MO can respond to MG, but on closing government, the government whip is the only one who can respond to opening to closing opposition. So I think explicit responses inside opposite you are very important. This will be my individual feedback. You feel free to contact me on Facebook if you have any more questions, uh, primarily because my phone is going to die soon. So even if you have questions now, I'm only going to have a short amount of time to answer them, but if you do have some short questions now, feel free to ask them. Do you have any? Uh, do you have any personal feedback on uh, whip uh, closing opposition whip? Because I haven't heard any. Okay, so yeah, I think that the uh, feedback I was giving now was supposed to refer to both whips because I think that was the, a mistake you both made. I used closing government whip as an example of opposition within a debate. I could have said closing opposition whip ex instead of that. I think that the feedback for you is also more explicit responses to closing government. I think also what you did well was try to compare your extension to the opening opposition, uh, which is something that your member did not do. The reason why I felt that you could have done better is because you pointed out an impact without pointing out the mechanism. So you say people dying and being horribly mistreated is worse than us losing companies. That's true if the impact is proven. So I would say spend more time on proving the mechanism. Why do you think this will comparatively be so horrible for people, even if we concede some of government benefits? So I think a good example of how this works in WIPs is HWS round robin 2017 final. So the opposition whip is Sela Nevo. The way he whips is when he responds to the other teams, he always has First, he gives his specific response, like his specific rebuttal to a certain point he's rebutting. And then he says, here's what my extension added to the debate, and here's how it interacts with other teams. He uses his extension as a response to other teams. And if he, has to, if he uses this as a response, this also forces him to make the response completely, to explain the mechanisms behind the response, to explain why the mechanisms are the one he claims and not the one the other side claims. So maybe trying to use your extension as rebuttal 
would be a way to first explain the mechanisms, not just point out the impacts. But yeah, the majority of feedback I gave to government with also goes for you. So yeah, more direct response to the team, to the team that's that, that that's opposite you, and be wary of new content because when you try to talk about minorities and black people, that was a new framing of the extension brought by your member, which was specifically about poor people being perceived as robbers and leeches, whereas the racial and ethnic element of this is something completely newly added in your speech. If you want this to fly, try to frame it at least as rebuttal, or as an extension of what your member was saying, rather than just saying it, because it makes it harder for me to credit that. Does this make sense? Yeah, totally. Can I ask okay. one more question? Uh, sure. Uh, have time. So, uh... Could you please explain how we could frame our backlash argument so it could be more impactful and so you could believe that there, it is a high amount of people or it is uh, probable to do this at all uh, in, this, in this motion? Okay, so I'm not sure how prudent that argument is in general. I think that argument is hard to prove because the majority of people would benefit from this policy, right? So the majority of people, both lower class and middle class, even under this definition from OG, but even more so if they went more radically, the majority of people would gain more wealth and more opportunity than they have now. The people backlashing would be the ones who lost their wealth, which are the rich people. And I think at that point, the, major the majority of society would not backlash. What I would try to stress is maybe run this through the lens of explaining why the state would be horribly inefficient and horribly corrupt in doing this, which is what I explained earlier, and then explain why this would lead not just to state inefficiency, but also to huge dissatisfaction against the state. And very often this then escalates into things such as violent protests, such as clashes against the police and stuff like this. So this can lead to societal conflict, not because people are going to backlash against each other, but because the state is going to horribly fail at doing this, and that's why everybody's going to be worse off. I think in a motion which benefits the majority of society as opposed to the 1%, it's very hard to argue that the middle class, who is the majority of society, is going to backlash against the poor because the line between poor and lower middle class is not that explicit, and there's not that many people below the line of poverty anyway, at least in the liberal democracies which you say that this applies to in your speeches. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you very if, much. Thanks. If, if if there are no further questions, I really hope this made sense. If there are, send uh, this send send them to me on Facebook. Thank you for the debate. I enjoyed this, and hopefully, judge some other time soon. Thank you.